Hello friends, I welcome you to the fifth installment in this calm reading of a collection of short stories entitled The Sandman's Hour. If you enjoy these readings, it would be great if you would click the like button and perhaps even subscribe to ensure the continuation of these narrations. And now, settle into that place where you can safely relax. Perhaps that's your chair, or your sofa, or your bed. Once you are settled, close your eyes and take a deep breath. As you exhale, you can feel your body unwind. Let's take another deep breath. Nothing matters now. The day is done. All that is left to do is listen to the stories and get ready for sleep. And so we begin. Dorothy and the Portrait Dorothy was very fond of her grandmother and grandfather and liked to visit them. But there were no little girls to play with, and sometimes she was lonely for someone of her own age. She would wander about the house, looking for the queer things that grandmothers always have in their homes. The hall clock interested Dorothy very much. It stood on the landing at the top of the stairs, and she used to sit and listen to its queer tick talk and watch the hands which moved with little nervous jumps. Then there were on its face the stars and the moon and the sun. And they all were very wonderful to Dorothy. One day she went into the big parlor, where there were pictures of her grandfather and grandmother, and her great-grandfather and great-grandmother also. Dorothy thought the greats looked very sedate, and she felt sure they must have been very old to have been the parents of her grandfather. But the picture that interested her the most was a large painting of three children, one a little girl about her own age, and one other older and a boy who wore queer-looking trousers, cut off below the knee. His suit was of black velvet, and he wore white stockings and black shoes. The little girls were dressed in white, and their dresses had short sleeves and low necks. The other girl had black hair, but the one that Dorothy thought was her age had long, golden curls like hers. Only the girl in the picture wore her hair parted, and the curls hung all about her face. Dorothy climbed into a big chair and sat looking at them. I wish they could play with me, she thought, and she smiled at the little golden-haired girl. And then, wonderful to tell, the girl in the picture smiled at Dorothy. Oh, are you alive? asked Dorothy. Of course I am, the little girl replied. I will come down if you would like to have me and visit with you. Oh, I should be so glad to have you, Dorothy answered. And then the boy stepped to the edge of the frame, and from there to the top of a big chair which stood under the picture, and stood in the chair seat. He held out his hand to the little girls, and helped them to the floor in the utmost courtly manner. Dorothy got out of her chair and asked them to be seated, 
and the boy placed chairs for them beside her. What is your name? asked the golden-haired girl, for she was the only one who spoke. That was my name, she said, when Dorothy told her. I lived in this house, she continued, and we used to have such good times. This is my sister and my brother. The little girl and boy smiled, but they let their sister do all the talking. We used to roast chestnuts in the fireplace, she said, and once we had a party in this room and played all sorts of games. Dorothy could not imagine that quiet room filled with children. Do you remember how we frightened poor old Uncle Zack in this room? She said to her brother and sister, and then they all laughed. Do tell me about it said Dorothy. These glass doors by the fireplace did not have curtains in our day, said the little girl, and there were shells and other things from the ocean in one cupboard, and in the other there were a sword and a helmet and a pair of gauntlets. My brother wrapped a sheet around them and put on the helmet and the gauntlets, and Taking the sword in his hand, he climbed into the cupboard and sat down. We girls closed the doors and hid behind the sofa. Uncle Zack came in to fix the fire, and my brother beckoned to him. Poor Zack dropped the wood he was carrying and fell on his knees, trembling with fright. The door was not fastened, and my brother pushed it open and pointed the sword at poor Uncle Zack. Don't hurt poor old me, said Zack very faintly. I ain't done nothing, deed I ain't. You told about the jam the children ate, said my brother in a deep voice. And you know you drank the last drop of rum Mammy Sue had for her rheumatism. And for this you must be punished. And he brought the sword down on the floor of the cupboard with a bang. Poor Uncle Zack fell on his face with fright. This was too much for my sister and me, and we laughed out. You never saw anyone change so quickly as Uncle Zack. He jumped up and we ran. But my brother had to get out of his disguise, and Uncle Zack caught him. He agreed not to tell our father if we did not tell about his fright, and so we escaped being punished. Tell me more about your life in this old house, said Dorothy, when the little girl finished her story. But just then the picture of Dorothy's great-grandmother moved and out she stepped from her frame. She walked with a very stately air toward the children, and put a hand on the shoulder of the little girl, who had been telling the story, and said, You better go back to your frame now. Oh dear, said the little girl, I did so dislike being grown up, and I had forgotten all about it, when my grown up self reminds me. That is the trouble when you are in the room with your grown-up picture, she told Dorothy. You see, I had to be so sedate after I married that I never even dared to think of my girlhood. But you come in here again some day, and I will tell you more about the good times we had. The boy mounted the chair first and helped his sister back into the frame. Dorothy looked for her great-grandmother, but she too was back in her frame, looking as sedate as ever. The next day, Dorothy asked her grandmother who the children were in the picture. This one, she said, pointing to the little golden-haired girl, was your great-grandmother, and you were named for her. 
and the other little girl and boy were your grandfather's aunt and uncle. They were your great-great-aunt and uncle. Dorothy did not quite understand the great-great part of it, but she was glad to know that her stately-looking great-grandmother had once been a little girl like her. And some day, when the great-grandmother's picture is not looking, she expects to hear more about the fun the children had in the days long ago. Mistress Pussy's Mistake A very kind gentleman, who lived in a big house, which was in the midst of a beautiful park, had a handsome cat, of which he was very fond. While he was sure Pussy was fond of him, he knew very well she would hurt the birds, so he put a pretty ribbon around Pussy's neck, and on it a little silver bell, which tinkled whenever she moved, and this warned the birds that she was near. Pussy resented this, but pretended she did not care. One day, a thrush was singing very sweetly on the bough of a tree which overhung a small lake. Pussy walked along under the tree and, looking up at the thrush, said, Madam Thrush, you have a most beautiful voice, and you are a very handsome bird. I do wish I were nearer to you, for I am not so young as I was once, and I cannot hear so well. The thrush trilled a laugh at Pussy, and said, Yes, Miss Puss, I can well believe you wish me nearer, but not to see or hear me better, but that you might grasp me. Pussy pretended not to hear the last remark, but said, My beautiful thrush, will you not come down where I can hear you better? I cannot get about as nimbly as I used to when I was young, or I would go to you. I cannot sing so well on the ground, replied the thrush. You can come up here, even if you are not so spry as you were. But tell me, do you not find the bell you wear very trying to your nerves? Oh, no, answered Sly Pussy. It is so pretty that I am glad to wear it, and my master thinks I am so handsome that he likes to see me dressed well. And then he can always find me when he hears the bell. That is why I wear it. I understand, answered the thrush, and we birds are always glad to hear it too and she trilled another laugh at Pussy and added, You are certainly a very handsome creature, Miss Puss. Pussy all this time had very slowly climbed the tree, for she wanted the thrush to think she was old and slow, but the bird had her bright eyes upon her. When Pussy reached the branch the thrush was on, she stopped and seated herself. Now, my pretty little friend, do sing to me your loudest song. She hoped it would be loud enough to drown the tinkle of the bell. The thrush began, and was soon singing very sweetly. Pussy took a very cautious step, and then remained quiet. The thrush stopped singing and spread her wings. Oh, do not stop, said Puss. Your song was so soothing, I was in a doze. Do sing again. And she moved a little closer. The thrush took a step nearer to the end of the bow, and said, I am glad you like my voice. I will sing again if it pleases you so much. She began her song, but she kept her eyes on Puss and as Puss drew nearer, she moved closer to the end of the swinging bow. She had reached a very high note when Puss gave a spring, 
but the thrush was too quick. She flew out of Pussy's reach, and Splash went Pussy into the lake, for she had not noticed that the thrush was moving to the end of the bow. So intent was she on the thought of catching her. Poor Pussy was very wet when she scrambled to the bank of the lake, and the birds were chirping and making a great noise. How did you like your bath, Miss Puss? The thrush called to her. You should never lay traps for others, for often you fall into them yourself. The Shoemaker Rat One day a rat gnawed his way into a pantry, and after he had eaten all he wanted, he grew bold and went into the kitchen. There the cook saw him and chased him with a broom, but not being able to hit him as he ran out of the door, she picked up a pair of shoes that were standing near and threw them after him. The rat picked them up and put them on. On his way home he met a cat. What have you on your feet? he asked the rat. Can you not see, my dear Tom? said the rat. They are shoes. I am a shoemaker, and, of course, must wear my own product. Make me a pair, said the cat, and I will spare your life. Very well, replied the rat, but first you must bring me some leather. So the cat ran away and brought back two hides. When the rat saw the amount of leather, he was struck with an idea. My dear Tom, he said, I can make you a suit of clothes, and a pair of gloves, as well as the shoes, and you will be the envy of all the other cats. Tom was delighted, and told the rat to hurry and make the outfit. The wise rat first made the gloves and covered Tom's sharp claws. Then he made the shoes for the hind feet, and when he had that done he felt safe. Now you must wait, he said, until I get something with which I can fasten the coat. He ran away and returned with some long, sharp thorns. Next the rat put the leather around Tom's body and drew it tight, fastening it with a thorn, which he pushed so that the sharp point pricked Tom. What are you doing? asked Tom, angry at being hurt. But he could not move, the leather costume was so stiff and tight. But he grabbed at the rat with his mouth and caught him by the tail. The rat ran, leaving his tail in Tom's mouth. I'll know you, Tom called after him. When I am out of this suit, I will catch you and eat you. The rat had not thought of that. And he wondered what he should do, but he was a wise old fellow. And when he reached home, he called all his brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts about him. I met a cat today, he said, who had been to the city where all the styles are new, and he told me that all the city rats are having their tails cut off, so I had mine done. If you want to be in style, he told them, you must have your tails like mine. Does it hurt? asked one. Not a bit, answered the sly fellow and you have no idea how comfortable it is running about without a tail to look after. It is very expensive to have it cut, he explained. That is the only difficult part. I had to pay twenty pieces of cheese, but I watched while another fellow was having his cut, and I am sure I can do it as well as the rat that did mine. And if you wish to be in style at a very low rate, 
I will take off your tails for five pieces of cheese each. The rats all agreed and ran away to get the cheese. And while they were gone, the wise rat ran for a chopping knife. Soon he had the tails cut and a goodly store of cheese. Now, he said to himself, Tom will never know me from the other rats. He kept his eyes open for Tom, who had called his friends to help him out of his suit, and told them to watch for a rat without a tail. But when they saw all the tailless rats, they gave up looking for one who had put Tom into the suit of leather, and Tom, not liking to hunt any too well, gave it up also. But the next time I meet a rat, said Tom, I will catch him, no matter whether he has a tail or not. The Puppies A long distance from here, in a far eastern country, there once lived a very rich king. All kings are not rich, you know, but this one was, and his jewels were the most beautiful ever seen. But this king dearly loved all the good things of this world, and gave feasts and dances that lasted for days without anyone sleeping. Of course, he could not lead such a life as that and have good health, and at last there came a time when the king could not sleep. At last he offered a reward to anyone who could put him to sleep, no matter how it was accomplished. He said to the one who could do this, he would give half his kingdom. The poor king was the subject for many experiments, and when he had almost given up hope of ever sleeping again, there came a strange-looking man to the gate of the castle. He wore around his neck many chains and strings of queer-looking beads. I can make the king sleep, he said, but I must be allowed to have the grounds of the castle to myself, and the king must obey me in every way. The king was ready to do anything, and so the strange-looking man began his work. But before he would do anything for the king, he insisted upon having half the kingdom given into his hands. And when this was done, he set to work. No one was allowed to be near him, and the king was left alone in the castle with him. One morning, not long after, the king saw what looked to be a sea of green all around the castle, but it really was a bed of green leaves, and soon there appeared white flowers among the leaves, and then the strange man told the king to walk among them. Soon the king felt a drowsy feeling stealing over him, and he sat down in the midst of the sea of green, and in a few minutes... He was sound asleep. Then the strange man began to repeat something in a sing-song tone, and wave his hands over the sleeping king. He walked among the leaves and flowers, repeating his queer rhyme. And the leaves and flowers grew taller and taller, until the king could not be seen, and the man moved away, still chanting, Poppy! Poppy, flower of sleep, your drowsy spell around him keep, for I can all his kingdom take, if you do not let him wake. The poppies grew until they reached the top of the castle, and everyone who went near to look for the king fell under the spell of their strange power, until the people around gave it up and the strange man became king. He built a new castle, and the old one was forgotten. All went well with the new king, 
until a young man called at his castle and asked him about the old king. And the servants told him how the strange flowers had grown around the castle, and no one could go near, and that everyone thought that the old king was dead. The new king, when he heard that the stranger was asking for the old king, had him driven from the castle. Tell your master, said the stranger to the servants, that he will hear from me again. The stranger went into the woods, where there lived an old witch, and at midnight they came out and went to the castle, among the strange flowers. The witch held her hands high over her head, and waved them up and down, saying all the time, Poppy, poppy, sleepy flower, now I have you in my power, I would have you shorter grow, until the sleeping one you show. Down came the tall flowers and bushes, until the young man cried out, Here he is, and then the flower ceased to grow small. The witch knelt beside the sleeping king and whispered in his ear, Awake, good king, tis break of day, and drive the false king far away. The king opened his eyes and looked at the witch and the young man beside her. What has happened? he asked. I will leave you to tell him, said the witch. The sun is up and I must go. When you offered to give half your kingdom to the one who could make you sleep, said the young man, I set out for your castle with a box which contained the strange flower that had the power to make people sleep. But it had to be used with the greatest care, and I alone knew the secret of using it, for it was given to my grandmother by an old witch doctor. Before I could reach you, I was overtaken by a band of robbers, and the box stolen. They made me tell what I intended doing with the flower, on pain of death. But I did not tell the whole secret. Then they put me in a cave, and rolled the stone in front of it, too heavy for me to move, and left. I was almost dead from starvation, when I was found by some peasants who nursed me until I was well enough to travel, when I hurried here, only to find that one of the band of robbers had taken your whole kingdom after putting you to sleep with the charmed flower. He drove me from the castle when he heard that I was asking for you, and if it had not been for the witch who lives in the wood, I should not have been able to awaken you. She knew the secret, as she is the daughter of the witch who gave the flower to my grandmother. When the king heard the strange story, he hurried with the young man to the castle where the robber king lived. He was asleep when they arrived, and the servants, who did not like their new master, ran out to meet the old king, and when they heard what had happened, they went back to the castle and bound the robber while he slept. And when he awoke, he was so frightened that he promised to tell where the rest of his band could be found if they would spare his life. This they promised to do, and the country was rid of these bad men, for they were put on a ship and made to work the rest of their lives. The king was so grateful to the young man who rescued him, that he made him his heir. And when the king died, he left him his kingdom.